maybe on some of the seats, that's the black book. The black book with the gold lettering on the back is a Bible. We want you to have a copy of the Scriptures because we want you to know that God says it, that God says so. And I hope that that's the impression that we give every time we preach the Word of God. Sometimes I'll say, it's my opinion. And if it's my opinion, then it's probably not worth a terrible great amount. Maybe I'll give you something to think about. But when we preach the Word of God, God said so. God said so. And my heart's desire is that you leave here knowing God said. And it really doesn't matter what Pastor said. If God didn't say it, it doesn't mean anything at all. And if Pastor said it, well, uh, God already said it. So that's all that matters as well. So that's our, that's our perspective as we look at the Scripture this morning. So John chapter 4. I want to thank the folks that helped with last night's activity and dressed up in the mall. It went off marvelously. Uh, one of the best groups ever to dress up and to hide in the mall. And nobody got arrested and it was just great. It was fantastic. So thank you so much for the effort that you put forth. We had a really good time. And you know, you helped to impact our teams. You made a good activity that helped make the preaching. Uh, have context and so forth last night. And so yesterday we actually looked at when Jesus said to the uh, talk to the Pharisees about being white in sepulchers, and outward they're uh, you know they're they're painted and they're beautiful, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones. And when I saw Brother John's outfit last night, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but we really we really had a marvelous time. And brother, brother Tim just doesn't look right without a mullet. He just ought to have a mullet, I think. I uh, normally, I'm trying to grow mine out. Some folks are wondering, Pastor, what's the deal with your hair? Why don't you get a haircut? My barber broke her arms, and so until that gets better, uh, I might be, I might be looking like Brother Tim before very long. We'll see. Uh, John chapter four. John chapter four. That was only half of a joke, but I noticed nobody laughed. <laughs> John chapter 4, and if you'll look down to verse 27, please, we'll read our text today. We're going to read several verses, actually. I'm going to read all the way to verse 38, so uh, however many verses that is. I want to say it's 11, but I might have to go back to school to figure it out. Verse 27, Upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man which told me all the things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said his disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him out to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit under life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that wherein you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors." We'll pray. Father, thank You for this text today which so clearly reflects the heart of our Savior. Help us to understand it. And God, help us as well to respond to it today. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now, I hope that you will just try to listen hard and overlook the singing in the back room. Um, if, if somebody just gave us about $2 million, we could buy a larger facility and put the kids way away from us. And uh, then you wouldn't have to hear them. So that's all it'll take. Uh, otherwise, uh, bear with us. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to know that they're having a church service back there and singing their songs, and they're going to hear the same kind of preaching uh, for their age that we're hearing here. Let me tell you something, you folks that have helped invest with our youth in our church. Uh, they are the now generation. Our young people are right now. I remember growing up, and uh, my pastor used to say a lot, you guys are the future. You're the future leaders of this church. And he was right about it, but he wasn't completely accurate. We were the present. We were the present. And that's what our young people are right now. We don't reach our kids right now. We don't have a future. And so the present is when we're supposed to reach them. And our young people have tender hearts and God's working in their lives. And they're already serving God right now in the present. I think kids can win more people to Jesus than adults can. 
and they can have their lives impacted more than adults can. I'm not saying uh, that's true in every instance, but we need to value our youth, and so the investment that we make in them is well worth it. So bear with it. You hear uh, the distracting singer or whatever in church, just remember this is one of the most important things we're doing, and so we're just, gonna, we're just going to live with it and enjoy it while we can. And you'll learn after a while, just ignore it. Uh, I can, I'll be honest with you, I can sleep right through a baby crying. It doesn't bother me a bit. A baby can be just, just wailing its lungs out, and I don't even hear it. And so uh, you can do the same thing for junior church as well. All right. You say, Pastor, you sound like a cruel person. Well, it's pro I'm probably not. Verse 27. Verse 27. <laughs> Upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? You remember the context? If you were here last week, or if you're familiar with John chapter 4, you remember Jesus is on his way to Galilee, but he must needs go through Samaria, and he's by the well, the well at Sychar, Jacob's well, which had a storied history very significant to the Samaritan people that were there. Very spiritual place in their mind, actually. So much so that they felt as though it was okay to worship God in the high place or in the mountain that was near them instead of going to Jerusalem. Also, we know there was a great deal of tension between the Jews and between the Samaritans. So much so that when Jesus sat down wearied at the well and His disciples went into the city to get something to eat, uh, to bring back to Him, that when Jesus sat there and the woman came to draw the well and He asked her to draw water for Him to drink, she said, how is it that thou being a Samaritan or a Jew askest drink of me being a Samaritan? She said, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And so, even without studying uh, contemporary history of the times, it's easy to tell from our context that the Jews and the Samaritans did not speak to one another. And that probably was a source of some of the religious contention between the two. Uh, the, the Jews, particularly the Pharisees, would have been very, very convinced about correct worship of God. Now, I say correct worship of God, I mean from their perspective. Because Judaism, instead of what the Bible had established for worship of God, was, firmly, was already firmly established. The synagogue form of worship, uh, in anticipation of the destruction of the temple, had already been established. And so a lot of the way that the Jews worshiped God wasn't the way that God said to worship Him. But what God did say to do was to worship at Jerusalem. You remember that? Uh, God, told the, God told His people where He was and how to worship Him. Remember the woman's important question? She was changing the subject after Jesus had told her that she had had five husbands and the man that she was living with was not her husband. And she instantly goes off to say, well, you know, uh, our fathers worship here in this mountain. But the Jews say we have to worship in Jerusalem. And you remember the answer Jesus came or gave. He said, well, believe me, the time comes when you're not going to worship in this mountain or in the temple at Jerusalem. But he went on to say, God's a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him, and must worship him in spirit and truth. And he said, salvation's of the Jews. And we're reminded, you don't come to God your clever, uh, well-thought-out way. You come to God the way that He's provided for us. And that's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Further on, we're going to see uh, Jesus telling His disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Probably that's my favorite verse in the Bible until I read another one that I think is my favorite <laughs> as well. But that's probably my favorite verse in the Bible because it so clarifies that Jesus is the only way. Well, this woman has come to Jesus now and the disciples have come back and they see her here. And you know, I think a lot of times when we read this text of the Scripture because it's so loaded, here we are in the midst, in the middle of passages that give accounts that the other Gospels don't even record. And so, John's perspective of the Gospel, which is helping us to understand how to believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing we might have life through His name, the key verse being John 20, verse 30. John's perspective here is showing us how people believed in Jesus. How people came to Jesus. So this woman at the well comes to Jesus, and she's an unlikely candidate. She's an unlikely candidate because of who she is ethnically. She's a Samaritan. And they worship in the wrong place, and they're, they're the wrong folks. They've intermarried, and they're not good Jewish people, and they're outcasts as far as the Jews are concerned. And not only that, but 
man, she, she didn't tell Jesus about herself, but what Jesus knew about her, she was the wrong person. She had five husbands. Now, my assumption here, by the way that the dialogue goes on in the context, is not that she had a husband and uh, he ate her cooking and died. And that she had a husband and he went on vacation with her and died. She had a husband and whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, I don't think she was a black widow. I think she left her husbands. She's an unfaithful woman. I and mean, she certainly was not faithful to the man she was living with because she's living with a man that wasn't even her husband. And what we see here is the kind of people that Jesus saves. The kind of people Jesus saves. And so here she is at the well. Notice the disciples came back and they saw her with the Son of God. Okay, so that's where we pick up in verse 27. Uh, in verse 27, the Bible says, Upon this came His disciples and marveled that He talked with the woman. That's loaded, isn't it? Marvel means to be amazed at, to wonder at. So the disciples come, and it's pretty incredible to talk to her. Now, they don't know that she's had five husbands, and that the woman, or that the, the, the man she's with isn't her husband. They just know that she's a Samaritan woman. And what that means is that they probably wouldn't speak with her. But the Bible says about them, uh, they, they, they said uh, they marveled uh, they talked to the woman yet no man said what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her they never said anything and that was probably a pretty good response on their part wasn't it uh, they're about to get a lesson here and we're about to get the same lesson but it's really interesting that the disciples did not say uh, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her I want to remind you about these same disciples these are the individuals who, when they were following Jesus, were walking through a field of corn on the Sabbath day, and they plucked uh, corn and they, you know, they they it, they uh, got it out of the husk with their hands and they ate it. You remember what the Pharisees said about them? Your disciples are eating on the Sabbath day. These are the same disciples that uh, one of them would have been would have been a publican, and so. They're amazed at the kind of a person Jesus is talking to, but they are intelligent enough to say, you know what, if I say something, you know what the implication of that is. Have you ever just thought, you know, I better keep my mouth shut about this one? You ever just thought, well, you know what, if I want to open that can of worms, some of those worms are mine that are there? And I think that probably is their perspective. The Scripture doesn't comment any more than that, but I think it's pretty neat that it just tells us that. I really feel like I'm there when I get the perspective of the woman, the perspective of Jesus, and then the perspective of the disciples. And they come back and it's like, oh, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. She just left. And she left her water pot. Did you notice that in the text? She came to draw water, but Jesus promised her that if she knew who it was that was speaking to her, that she should ask Him and He could give her the kind of water that would make it so that she'd never thirst again. And she said, sir, give me this water. I won't have to come to the well anymore to draw. Jesus, of course, was telling her something that was helping her to understand, just like He had illustrated with Nicodemus by saying you have to be born again. He was illustrating for her that spiritual water is different than physical water, and spiritual water is the real water that we need. And so her need was spiritual. And guess what? She came to draw physical water but when she found spiritual water, she took off and went to town and left her pot. Never drew physical water. Friend, the perspective of this woman here ought to help us to realize what our real need is. You know, it's incredible how often individuals seek a church because they need something. I get calls all the time. Every single week I get calls from people that need something. Very infrequently do people see what their need is, though. Sometimes a well is a way to meet someone so that you can show them what their real need is. But you know, oftentimes people don't know what their real need is. Once they realize it, it's just like it was for us, isn't it? You realize, that's the water I need. Friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, can I say to you that your problems, the things that you're dealing with in life, they're not your real problems. The real problem is a spiritual matter and the matter is that of separation between you and God. And the reality of it is that 
judgment is what you face without Jesus Christ before God. And Jesus is the place where God's judgment is taken on an innocent, sinless lamb and placed on the cross. And that's the place where you can really intersect at the place of God's love. I was impressed a couple of weeks ago when we were uh, two Saturday nights ago preaching to the teenagers from uh, 1 John, and I think it was chapter 4, where the Bible talks about, where Jesus talks about the love and talks about God's love. And it's interesting that the, the, the word love is in the same phrase or in the, uh, is, is, well, let me just read it to you. I'm going off on a message and, and uh, I'm on excursion and, and I'm going to mess you up if I don't show it to you. Uh, let me go to 1 John. You can turn there if you please, but hold your place in John chapter 4. That's the only other place we'll be today. Uh, but uh, let's see, 1 John, and I'm going to change my Bible. Chapter 4. If a man, or verse 17, here is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And then verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And it's really interesting the correlation between the word fear and the word love. You know, usually when I think of antonyms or synonyms, I don't think about uh, love and fear together. I still see a relation between the two. But you know, until you come to the cross of Jesus Christ, you never see the intersection of fear and love. What drives us to the cross? What drives us to the cross? Drives us. Pushes us to the cross. What? Fear does. What draws us to the cross? Love does. And when you get to the cross, my friend, you see where fear and love intersect and where fear is cast out by love. And it's just a beautiful phrase, beautiful statement, and that encapsulates the person of Jesus Christ. I just never really saw it from that perspective until studying in 1 John a few weeks ago. I'm sure you know I've heard it or taught it or somebody's preached it before, but it just, it just makes so much sense that the cross is the place where fear and love meet and fear is cast out. And here's a woman sitting at the well. You can go back to John 4 now. Here's a woman sitting at the well who meets a man, and when he tells her about herself, what do you think her response is? Uh-oh. Right? He knows everything about me. She's not going to snow this individual with her fake religion of worshiping in the mountains. She's not going to snow this individual by not telling him about her lifestyle that she's lived. And yet, she met Jesus. And she met a loving Savior. And now she goes into the city and there's two things that are happening at the same time. There are two stories here. There's a story of the disciples and talking to Jesus about eating. That's our message today. We probably don't get to next week's message today. The next story is the people from Samaria coming out to meet the man that the woman told them about. Okay, so there's two stories, two storylines and they intersect. There's just so much uh, that, that shows us who Jesus is and how to, to believe that He's the Christ and to have life in His name. And these stories help us. Okay, so now in, uh, in verse 31, we have a little interlude. If you're seeing this like an act or a play, you can see the curtains drawn, the woman goes away, uh, the, the disciples see her go, leave her pot and they're amazed, curtains draw, right? And then the curtains open again, and here's the next scene. Jesus is sitting probably on the well, and His disciples are sitting around Him. And now, the Bible says, in the meanwhile, His disciples prayed Him, saying, Master, eat. Now, pause there for just a second, and go back uh, to, to, to verse 6. Now, Jacob's well was there, the Bible says, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with His journey, sat thus on the well is about the sixth hour. Okay? Uh, and in verse 8, the Bible says, His disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Now, why is it that Jesus was at the well? Well, the Scripture plainly implies that He was tired and He was hungry. Doesn't it? Isn't it so? So Scripture plainly shows us here that Jesus was tired and hungry, and so He sat down at the well and His disciples went into the city to buy him meat. Why were it was Jesus more weary than his disciples? Well, it's because he always did more. Anywhere Jesus went, he taught, he ministered, and and he was always serving. Everywhere he went, he even served his disciples. So he's come to a place where physically 
He's just worn out. And friend, you'll come to that place too. Even in God's service, you'll come to the place where you're just, if you're a servant, where you're served out in a sense. You just, you're worn out. But there's a key here in our text, and I want us to see it, because there is a lie that's taught in Christianity today that the Scripture contradicts here in this passage of Scripture. And that lie is that you can serve God and it will actually destroy you. I've, I've met Christians that are burned out. Have you? you? Ever met somebody and I mean it was just like at, at one period in their life and maybe they were even in, individuals that influenced you to Jesus. Many times someone in, influences you, they, they preach the gospel with you or they encourage you or they teach you Bible truth and, and so by their serving God they've encouraged you to serve and then later on you see them and they're no longer serving God. And so you ask yourselves, what happened? And they'd say, I burned out. I burned out. And they're, they're using the analogy of a candle which burns down until it literally the, the wax is gone, the wick is gone, and it's burned out. A lot of Christians talk about burnout. And oh man, are there some pious statements about burnout. Now here's not what I'm saying today. Just, just get this at the beginning. I'm not saying that believers don't need rest. And I am not saying that God doesn't make us able to be restored or refreshed through rest. Does everybody know what I'm not saying then? I better understand. I'm not saying that today. But what I'm saying is that the Scripture here does indicate that there's no such thing as burning out living for Jesus. Now, look, let's look at it. We're going we're to glean a couple of things. And, and maybe if you're just worn out, maybe if you're kind of on the edge of being burned out, maybe you'll find some things here that will help you. All right, in verse 31, the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. So the idea of pray is to, to ask a request of or to entreat. So they're asking, Jesus, would you please eat? We, now there's a couple things about that. One, they've gone to the effort of getting him something to eat. You ever prepared a meal for someone they didn't want to sit down and eat it? It's a pet peeve of mine that I want to eat when the food's hot. Um, my mouth starts salivating when the food hits the table. Does it do that to you? And my wife has this uncanny, unnatural ability to walk away and go do things when, when it's time to eat. I don't know how she can do it. I'm like, get back here. Let's pray and let's eat. It's time to eat. You know, it's just tough on me. But she can do it. She can just, oh, you know, she spends all this time preparing a nice meal and, and it smells delicious and you sit on the table. And when's the best time to eat a hot meal? When it's hot, right? So set it down and walk. There's people that do that. You know what you hate it? You go to a restaurant and everybody, we have a group of church people are all going together and, and I don't know, maybe I need to just abolish manners, you know, good manners or good behavior, etiquette, that sort of thing. But everybody orders at a fast food restaurant, and then Charlie shows up. <laughs> Everybody's going together, and then Charlie. You, anybody ever been to a fast food restaurant with Charlie? Okay, then help me with this. All right, when does Charlie get there first? Or last, right? Okay, uh, and then Charlie gets there. And then he's in line, and then a whole bunch of people come in. And what does Charlie do when people come in behind him? Let's Let's go. Go. go ahead. I'll, I'll go after you. I hate Charlie's manners. I don't like him at all. He's, he's polite to the point of just being horrible. Uh, and then, so then everybody orders before Charlie. When will he get his food? Tomorrow. After everybody else in the restaurant. Meanwhile, my hot food is sitting on my table waiting to pray all together as a group in fellowship. <laughs> Isn't he a nice guy? <laughs> he really is, too. Uh, too nice. So, <laughs> and I'll eat the food when it's hot. And so, you, you know, the disciples come back from town. They went all the way to town to get food. And they come back out to feed Jesus. And he's talking to this woman, first of all. So, you know, she leaves, leaves her water pot. And it seems as though Jesus is not really focused on what really needs to be done, which is, let's eat. Master, eat. They entreated him, the Bible says. And Jesus had an astonishing statement. Now, Jesus isn't here saying, you know, I'm not hungry or I don't need food. But Jesus is saying something to the disciples about... He's, he's trying to give them perspective here. He's trying to help them understand something. And so, He said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Jesus said, I've got some things I've got to eat first, or I have meat 
that you don't even understand. You don't even know about it. Now when Jesus is talking about meat to eat that you know not of, then He knows something. And for us, we ought to say, what's that meat? What is it? What kind of meat is it? Who, who makes the best meat? Jesus or the disciple shopping in Samaria? Who gets the best meat? Well, obviously, evidently, Jesus does. And so the disciples, again, are understanding Him literally. Every time Jesus is speaking and John is sharing these accounts of Jesus and His encounter with people, Jesus is saying things to people that don't make a lot of sense because He wants them to understand the sense behind what He's saying. He's trying to get them to think. You ever uh, been just going along in a conversation, uh-huh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And then all of a sudden somebody said something and you're like, What? What did you say? Well, this is one of those things. And he got their attention. He said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And so they're starting to discuss it with themselves. They, the disciples said one another, Hath any man brought him to eat? Did any of you, did you give him something to eat? Did you try to feed him? Where did he get that? Did, any, did anybody, did you see anybody come here and give him food to eat? Jesus saith unto them, and here's the answer, and this is the point, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Now that's a two-part phrase. There are two independent sentences linked together there. My meat, one, is to do the will of him that sent me. My meat, two, is to finish the work of him that sent me. When you eat, when you're done, right? Hey, let's, let's take a break for lunch. Now let's finish and then we'll eat. Is what Jesus is saying. And Jesus isn't finished here doing the work. Now, there are a couple of things that contradict conventional uh, man, men's wisdom. The one is that serving God will burn you out. How was Jesus physically when He came to the well? Tired. He was weary. He was too tired to go to town. So He sits down on the well. How is Jesus now? Hey, I need to get this finished first. I'm not ready to eat yet. And that's the difference. And what is what's happened in between? An encounter. An encounter with somebody that needs Jesus. My friend, can I say to you, <coughs> there is a lot of busy work that we call ministry. And the busy work is things like going to town to get something to eat. And that will wear you out. The busy work will wear you out. But you know the meat won't. The meat won't. And that's what Jesus wants His disciples to understand. Guys, if we just go from place to place and we do the things that I've got to do, then we're not really doing what I came here to do. Why did Jesus need? Why is it the Scripture said must needs go through Samaria? Why did Jesus need to go through Samaria? Because He had some work there. And that work was his meat. And finishing the work was the way that he was going to be sustained. Friend, I have to say to you, you'll burn out doing anything but serving Jesus. I've watched it. I've seen enough to know God's Word's true about it. I've seen it. I've seen people in their lives saying, you know what, I just, it's just too much to serve God. And so they do the things that they need to do that keep them from serving God, and they never get energized. How many Christians say, well, you know what? When I get the time. You ever said that? We all have, haven't we? When I have time, you'll never have time to serve Jesus. But if you serve Jesus, you'll have time. There's just a principle here. There's just a truth here. You know, sometimes there are things that in man's economy or man's way of thinking don't add up. But in God's economy, they just do. Here's one. I don't understand this one, but it's just a fact. Church attendance on Sunday is inversely proportionate, or I should say inversely, it's proportionate to, effort to, to the effort to reach people during the week, particularly lost people. In ministry, that's just so. I don't know why it is. Uh, sometimes the people who attend are the people that you made the effort to reach. Most of the time, they're just people God sent. Just what it is. God just, God just has a way of rewarding the effort for harvest. He just has a, a way of just sending a response to harvest. 
And you know, here's another one of those truths. I mean, that, that's just true. I, I, it's, just, it's just universally true. I remember a few years ago when we, were, when we had purchased this building, and I'll be honest with you, I was not excited about trying to get it ready to move into. It was just a disaster in here. And the thing that frustrated me the most about it was that I knew that it was going to take all my time. I knew that it just, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to be a builder instead of, instead of a, a preacher. I just want to do that instead of the other. But you know what God did? He grew our church during that time. He knew my heart. Honestly, I just prayed to God. I said, God, you know my heart. And you know that I want to grow the church, which is the people, not the building. And God grew our church during that time. We saw people that basically came and said, would you please share the gospel with me? Brother Rodney that was here last Sunday, uh, I was down at Habitat Restore, and I was getting the windows that we put in here. And I was picking those up, and, and Rodney was working there, and he's helping load the windows. And he said, who are you? What do you do? And I saw a pastor, well, where's your church? I said, well, it's, uh, I gave him the, the address for our church. Oh, I'm going to come. He came that, that Wednesday night and got saved within a couple of weeks. And we just had that happen over and over again. Just got saved, got baptized, and, and God just does that sort of thing. Which, you know, sometimes we're out there, we're just working. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the work, and I'm going to make it happen. And sometimes God just makes it happen. But something has to happen in here first. The desire to do the will of Him that sent you has to happen first. Well, you know, we got to do this, and we got to do that, and we got to have, and we got to. Well, you know what? Those things are the response to the desire, but sometimes they come without the desire, and then they're just no good at all. And here Jesus is telling his disciples, guys, there's something that's better than food. If you've ever led somebody to Jesus, you know it. Is there a thrill in the world like seeing someone come to Jesus? Is there anything like it? Is there a taste? like the taste of the reward of the harvest. There's just nothing like it. There isn't anything like it. You know, it, it just, it's, it's a, because it's a response to uh, faith and obedience, and then you just see the supernatural happen right in front of you. You just see God's hand do something that's impossible for a man. And when you see that, man, it energizes you. Energizes you. How did Jesus make it? Can you imagine his, his schedule and his ministry? Three and a half years of literally being thronged incessantly from dawn to daybreak every single day, never being alone except when he would go alone to pray. He'd just escape his disciples so he could have time and fellowship with God. But he just never had downtime or alone time. You, know, you just don't see Jesus vacationing in his earthly ministry. How'd he make it? How'd he do it? Well, pastor, he was God. He laid aside his power as God mm -hmm. for his earthly ministry so that he could relate to men in every single way possible. How'd he do it? Well, the key is right here in John chapter 4. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. Are you tired out? You feel like I just I can't go another step? You know what, if pastor asked me for one more thing, you know, if, if, if I see, you know, the, we're blessed to have some, a need seen as a task assigned folks. If I see one more need, pastor won't ask, but, you know, if that out of order sign doesn't go off the back bathroom door, I know I'm going to be the guy fixing the toilet. You know, that sort of thing. It just comes in, oh, it's just wearing me out. By the way, the toilet needs fixed back there, just in case anybody doesn't know it. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm gonna, all right. It really does need fixed. That's, that's for real. Uh, <laughs> but the Bible says in, in verse 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and finish the work. And then he asked him, he said, Don't you guys have a saying? Say not ye, yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. So don't you guys have an expectation for harvest? My dad's here, and he says he has to be home in April because that's what he needs to plant if he decides to, whatever. But, uh, you know, if, if you plant, you need to plant at a certain time. And the expectation when you plant is that the harvest will come at a certain time. So about June, you start really looking at the wheat. And you start seeing, you know, checking it every day. I mean, it can just, a good hot day can really turn, the, the, turn it from green to gold. 
and when it's harvest time, you better get it in. Otherwise, it's, it's you're going to lose it. But you have an expectation when you plant for when the harvest will be. You plant at the wrong time, it's most likely the harvest won't be very good. But Jesus is telling them there's something better than the kind of harvest you understand. Because you understand that in four months, then's the harvest. But he said, I want to tell you about a different kind of a harvest that you don't have to wait for. That's one of the hard things, isn't it? You ever watch a little kid plant his first seed? Help plant a seed. I remember when we were little kids, we planted sunflower seeds in those red Dixie cups at our house. And boy, we're looking at those things constantly. And they pop up fast, don't they? They grow pretty well. Radishes grow pretty well. But sometimes you plant a seed and Man, most of the time I forget I planted it before it ever comes up and then it dies because I didn't take care of it when it comes up. Harvest oftentimes is something that's slow to wait for. But listen to me, when you're serving God, you don't have to wait for the harvest. That's what the Bible says. You know, a lot of times we get caught up in this, you know, we, we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which isn't making this point. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, Paul said, I planted a polis water, but God giveth the increase. And so we're thinking, well, there's no harvest until the planting and the watering. Well, that may be true of some individuals' lives, but hear me now, there's harvest. There's harvest right now for a lot of people. And I mean, the harvest time is now. In other words, they're ready to get saved right now. They're ripe right now. Probably a couple of times a week. And the Holy Spirit's really convicting me more and more about this. Probably a couple times a week. People interrupt my day. I mean, I'm talking about not, not you know, on the phone or not at church, but, you know, I'm trying to go to AutoZone or trying to go to Ace Hardware. Or I'm, I'm trying to just work on a project. I'm trying to get this done so I can get this done so I can get over here. And somebody stops me and tries to talk to me. And they start <laughs> talking to me. And, I, you know, and I'm a, I'm a talker. It's genetic. And uh, I can talk. But the reality of it is, is that I'm too busy to talk right now. And then all of a sudden, somebody wants to talk to me. And they start asking me questions. And next thing you know, they're asking me to tell them the gospel. I'm serious. It's almost like, well, what do you do? I work for the church. Well, what do you do for the church? I'm a pastor. Well, what's a pastor do? Well, I preach the gospel. What's the gospel? You know, it's like that. You know? Well, I got some questions about that, actually. I mean, man, it's basically how people... I have questions. I have questions I've been wanting to ask. It's, it's the harvest. It's plenty. It's just everywhere you go. Oh, there are folks you'll plant. I, I let, most of my block, most of my neighborhood, I'm planting. I'm sowing and I'm watering. There are people that, you know, that I'm, I'm sharing the gospel with and I'm working with them and, and, to get, and just sharing the gospel every chance that I can, but they're just not ready to be saved. But man, I'll tell you, this town is just full of people that are. It's just, just chock full. And God will put somebody on your heart or on your mind, and you'll know what I'm talking about. It's amazing. God just prepares a harvest. And you know, that's the kind. I love planting. I like watering. Not really so much. I like harvesting. Don't you? You ever go to the you pick strawberry patch? You pick blueberry patch? You pick, you know, fresh, fresh strawberries, and you know you can eat all the ones you want while you're uh, packing away the ones that you're going to pay for. And you know, I enjoy the harvest, don't you? Uh, you? You go and you find a, a tomato patch that's just overgrown with tomatoes, and take a salt shaker with you to help your blood pressure. And you go out and get a <laughs> get a tomato, take a bite out, and salt it. You know, just eat eat fresh tomatoes right off the vine, vine ripe tomatoes. And I like the harvest, don't you? I like to even go to wheat field and just take the, the kernels out of the house, put them in my mouth and chew them until it makes gum. And I chew, uh, you know, my own gum that I made out of the wheat that I'm chewing from wheat gum. And I just, I like a harvest. I like a harvest better than I like planting. I like a harvest better than I like uh, 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 watering. I just like a harvest. And friend, that's what God made, that's what God made our meat to be. It's the harvest. And sometimes, we have refused to be harvesters and we're more planters or waterers. Well, you know, I, I know the Bible says, go you therefore. I know it's talking to everybody, but you know, my kind of preaching the gospel is more like I'm more of a person who sows. No, you're not. You're a person who harvests or you're going to burn out. You never, if you never reap the harvest, you'll burn out. 
And Jesus is telling his disciples the same thing. He's trying to help them get it. You need to harvest. You need to reap a harvest. Or it'll just be religion to you. It'll just be work to you. It'll just be labor. The harvest is plenteous. And the kind of labor we need to do is different. Verse 35, then uh, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they're white already to harvest. Now, can you see it? Can you see it? What do you see? I see the city, and the road leading down to the well from the city. And I see a trickle of people starting to walk down the road. You see them? They're coming out of the city and they're following this woman who said, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. And they're coming and Jesus said, look on the fields. They're white already in the harvest. I don't have time to eat. Look at these people. They're coming. They're on the way. But friend, if you'll look at the harvest that way, you'll see an eternal soul in a person. You know the behavior of a person won't bother you so much. You know that people are kind of terrible. They just just innate character wise. People are just awful. And the things they'll do and the ways they'll behave is just irritating. But when you see a soul, who cares what they do? How many times, you know, you invite someone to church and they don't know how to behave in church. They get up, go to the bathroom, and they go to the drinking fountain, and they irritate everybody. Getting a drink right in the middle of the service, and you're trying to listen, and you know everybody turns around and looks at them, and then they go to the bathroom, and they go to the one where the water makes all the noise in there. And they turn the water on so nobody will hear bathroom sounds, and that's all you hear. It's like, man, they ought to know better to do that in church. Harvest, folks. Harvest. People are harvest. Jesus is watching this trickle of individuals, these men walking out from the village of Samaria, a place that the Jews wouldn't deign to go. They're too good to go there. And they couldn't go to the temple at Jerusalem because the Jews don't even want them there. But Jesus is sitting at Jacob's well, and they're coming to Him. And He said, look at the harvest, guys. He said, I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. He said, you just get to be part of the harvest, guys. Now, is that something worth your time or what? Would you rather, would you rather go ahead and help these poor folks get saved or would you rather go to dinner? What a privilege it is to be called to preach the gospel. Who's called to preach the gospel? We are. Every one of us. You say, Pastor, you're a preacher. Yes, I am, and so are you. You're a preacher too. Because the message is the gospel. And men, women, children are called to preach it. And you can partake of the harvest in that way. And that's God's plan for your life. You're burned out, you're worn out. Isn't it coincidental that you're not harvesting much? Isn't it coincidental there isn't much harvest? Well, I think not. I think it makes sense completely, doesn't it? Father, thank You for what we've learned today. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to come to the understanding that there's sustenance in serving Jesus, we pray in His name. Amen. Thanks for your great attention this morning. You are dismissed.